we're doing a study that in First Peter, and basically we're talking about adversity and how we should deal with adversity. Think about the challenges right now in your life. Maybe they're financial concerns. Maybe they're health concerns. Maybe they're relational concerns, employment concerns. Whatever it may be, how do we respond in a way that proclaims that we believe Jesus really did die on the cross, He really is alive, and He really is active in our lives? How do we proclaim our faith in Jesus during adversity? Well, that's what we're looking at in First Peter. Uh, Peter writes this letter 2,000 years ago to a group of people who were dealing with persecution. Their main adversity was they were being hated because of their faith. In fact, it was government-sponsored persecution. Nero was on the throne. He was a madman. He had made it illegal to basically be a Christian. And so many of these people have had to flee for their lives. They've had to leave their communities, some their families. They had to leave their livelihoods, and they had to scatter, basically, across the Roman Empire, especially into five eastern provinces that are today what is modern-day Turkey. That's where Peter writes, to these people who have been persecuted. And the question that Peter addresses here is, how should we respond when we are unfairly treated? How should we as Christians respond? Should we fight back? Should we act in kind? If they're mean, we're mean. Should we get a lawyer and sue them? What should we do? Well, that's the question. As you know, today we live in increasingly in a culture that is anti-Christian, that's becoming against Bible-believing Christianity. More and more people are turning again that, against that. For many people, all that is wrong in our world and in our country can be traced back to religious people, especially Bible-believing Christians. That's how some people think. I had some friends just a couple weeks ago were talking, and one of these people, they don't go to church, and they said, you know, the problem, there has been more deaths, more violence caused by religion than any other really reason. And I thought, oh, I want to get into this conversation, but discretion is sometimes the wisest thing. And the point is, religion has caused a lot of senseless violence in this world. Let's be honest, and let's be humble. But for many people, they believe that this world, honestly, would be a better place if there were fewer Christians. If there were, if there were fewer people who believe like you do or I do, uh, this world would be a better place. That's where we're coming to, that we who believe in the Bible, take the Bible seriously, are viewed more and more as being homophobic, sexist, hateful. We're the ones who are holding back humanity from reaching its next step in evolutionary development because of our archaic beliefs and traditions, and uh, that this world would be better, uh, better off without as many Christians. Wow. Wow. How do we respond to such animosity and hate? You go and express your Christian faith on many college campuses today and see what you find out. Um, how do you respond to that? How should we? Should we become militant, combative, and aggressive as we defend our cause? The Bible says that should not be our response. James says in James chapter 1, verse 20, it's a very important verse, James chapter 1, verse 20, James says, the anger of man, our anger does not achieve the righteousness of God. In other words, we don't advance God's cause here on earth by protest and by anger and by hate. We don't. So how should we respond? And the answer very simply, and this is the Christian way, is with love, not hate. I know we haven't always done that as a Christian church, but that's how we should respond, with love, not hate. In Matthew chapter 5, another passage to get us ready for our passage in Peter, in Matthew 5, 38 through 44, Jesus tells us about how we should not resist an evil person. If they slap you on the right cheek, turn to them the left cheek as well. If they want to sue you for your shirt, 
Well, then let them have your coat. If they force you to go one mile, which in that day, in the first century, Romans, soldiers in Palestine, in Israel, had the, had the authority to command anybody they see along the road, hey, carry this burden for me. They could require that for one mile. And Jesus said, go the extra mile. Carry it for two miles. Wow. And then Jesus tells us to love our enemies. Love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us. In keeping with this ethic of love, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 12, 17 through 21, he says, do not repay evil for evil to anyone. Don't act in kind. Never take your own revenge, but leave room for the wrath of God. If there's something that needs to be corrected, let God do it. Let Him get involved. Don't try and make it right in that way on your own, with your own anger. Leave room for the wrath of God. And then Paul says this in Romans 12, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. He's quoting Jesus basically here when it comes to loving our enemies. This is our ethic. For in so doing, you will keep heap burning coals of conviction and guilt upon his head. And then Paul finishes by saying, do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans chapter 12 and verses 17 through 21. The way we overcome evil is not with more evil, but with good. The best way to change the dynamic of any bad relationship is by love, not more hate. I'm reading a book right now by Bruce Shelley, a fine historian, about the history of the Christian church. And in the early days, the first century, he talks about how the, the early Christians transformed, impacted their world. And they did it by their conviction. Jesus is risen, and they would not change. You could kill them, but they're not going to change that confession, that conviction. They did it with their love. And they loved not just those in their group, but everyone. And how they showed that love in, in the first century was by insisting that every person that they're aware of, gets buried with a proper funeral. And they believe that being created in God's image, we all deserve that. And so rather than being just left to die and preyed upon by wild beasts, I mean, think of the savage conditions of the first century, they insisted on a proper burial for every person, whether they believed like they did or not. It really impacted the first century. And another way that they impacted their communities is by how they suffered, especially when it came to persecution. Young men and young women would be put into the arena, and wild beasts would be set upon them. They would be killed for their faith, and yet they took it with such calm courage that it impacted the people who were watching. You know, the Romans could be a pretty callous group of people, like most of the people in this world. But seeing young men and young women especially face willingly their own death for the sake of Christ, it touched them. And there's case after case of people coming to Christ because of what they saw by those who died for their faith. In fact, you know what the word martyr means? Martyr? We think of it as someone who dies for your faith. That's what a martyr is. The word martyr means witness, a witness. We think of witnessing by our lives, but one of the powerful ways that we can witness is by our death. And here these martyrs were willing to even sing praises to their Lord as they were dying for their faith, and it had a tremendous impact. We've had it good, let's face it, for the last 270, 300 years here in our country, And things are kind of switching and twisting, and now we're being viewed more as the problem than the solution. It's kind of sad, and it's scary, and all that. But make no doubt about it, God's strength is sufficient. The gates of Hades will not prevail against Christ's church. And no matter what happens, God will give us the strength to face whatever we have to face. And so, the Bible is clear, and it is consistent when it comes to our ethic When we are faced with meanness, we are to respond with kindness, always. 
We are not to respond in kind when someone mistreats us because of our faith. And I'm, that's hard for me. It goes against my grain. I'm a longshoreman. You push me, I'll push you, and I get upset, and I'll be ready to confront. But that's, when it comes to the issues of our faith, we need to take a loving approach. And that's what Peter's going to talk about in chapter 3. Peter makes the same point about this love ethic in chapter 3 of 1 Peter. In verse 9, for example, he says, Don't return evil for evil or insult for insult. Don't act in kind toward those who are mean to you. But give a blessing. Give a blessing instead. And then in verse 17 of chapter 3, he says, It is better, if God should will it so, for you to suffer for doing what is right than to suffer for what is wrong. So the message is keep taking the high road. And don't retaliate, because one day God will vindicate you. The word vindicate means to exalt, to reward. God will vindicate you for choosing love over hate. We need to have that as our conviction. We need to believe that. That's the message that Peter wants to give to us today. And it's consistent with the message in the rest of the Bible. So Peter's going to talk about the example of Jesus and how he suffered and was humiliated, crucified, and yet God vindicated him, exalted him, and rewarded him. And the lesson that Peter wants to teach us is simply this. Just as Jesus was ultimately vindicated by God when he suffered unjustly there on the cross, so we will be vindicated, exalted, glorified, whatever, rewarded by God when we suffer unjustly for Jesus' sake. We need to believe that. Last week we talked about convictions, and convictions is a strongly held belief that affects how we live. If it doesn't affect and change how you live, it's not a conviction. And we need to have this conviction that we do it God's way. We do it the loving way, even when we're treated unfairly. And here we're going to see Jesus' example. That's what he's going to talk to us about in 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22, Peter's just going to walk us through the major events of Jesus' life, especially as they relate to his humiliation on the cross and his exaltation, his vindication in heaven. Let's begin with Christ's crucifixion here. In verse 18, Peter writes, For Christ also died for our sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Peter, in rapid fashion, lists five statements about what Jesus did for us there on the cross. Let's look at them. First of all, Jesus died for our sins. This explains why Jesus went to the cross. It wasn't for his sins, it was for ours. He paid the penalty of sin, and the penalty of sin is death. Someone innocent, someone perfect had to pay that penalty. Jesus paid that for us. Second, Jesus died once for all. This indicates the sufficiency and the efficacy of Christ's death. His death paid the price for sin once for all time. We don't need to keep offering anything else. Third, Jesus died in our place, the just for the unjust, Peter says. This emphasizes the substitutionary nature of Jesus' death. He died in our place, the innocent for the guilty. Jesus, fourth, died in to bring us to God, to reconcile us to God. This emphasizes the purpose of Jesus' death. It was to reconcile us back to God by taking away the barrier of sin. A relationship with God is now only found through Jesus and He alone. And then fifth, finally, Peter says that Jesus died in the flesh there on the cross, but was made alive in the Spirit. Jesus wasn't defeated on the cross. He is victorious. And this brings us to the next major event that Peter mentions. First of all, first is Christ's uh, crucifixion, now Christ's proclamation. Peter continues his flow of thought here about Jesus in verses 19 and 20. Look, notice what he says. In which also in his human spirit, this is after the cross when Jesus died, Jesus went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison who once were disobedient. He's talking about a specific group when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark 
in which a few, that is, eight persons, Noah's family, were brought safely through the water, the flood. What is Peter talking about here? This is a challenge, p- challenging passage. Peter's describing a triumphal proclamation, announcement, made by Jesus after his death there on the cross, but before his resurrection. So when his body was in the tomb, Jesus in his spirit descended into Hades, the place of the departed dead, and told the fallen angels of Genesis 6, 1 through 4, about his victory on the cross. And if you want to know more about what this is referring to, you need to read Genesis 6, 1 through 4. I also give you 2 Peter 2, 4 and 5, 2 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5, and Jude only has one chapter, verse 16, Jude verse 16, if you want to read more about this. Now, why were these angels, these fallen angels, in prison? The best we can tell is because they had violated their boundaries as angels and had sexual relationships with women, and from their transgression, this is before the flood, because of their transgression, the offspring were called Nephilim. Nephilim, uh, the fallen ones. Literally, that's what it means, the fallen ones. So God put these fallen angels into prison awaiting judgment. And now, as best we can put it together, God, Jesus, following his death, has gone in his spirit to inform them of his victory on the cross. Otherwise, how would these fallen angels know? It's not like they have big screen TVs down in Hades monitoring us up here. So how would they know? So Jesus came to announce, to give a proclamation of his victory there on the cross. Now, please, follow Peter's line of thinking here, because we're about to engage in one of the most difficult passages to follow, to understand in the Word of God. We can understand it, but we need to pay attention, because Peter's, um, he's got a line of thought here that we've got to pay close attention to. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, He writes, and he mentions the fallen angels from Genesis chapter 6 in Noah's day, and this causes Peter now to make a comparison between the rescue of Noah's family, eight members, who were rescued from the flood through the ark. Remember, they're all on the ark. And he compares this now to the rescue of Christians, you and I today, through baptism, as symbolized by baptism. The water of the flood, the ancient flood, now becomes a symbol for the water of baptism. And notice how Peter links these two thoughts together in verse 21. He says in chapter 3, verse 21, corresponding to that, to what? The mention of water, the flood, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, let me be clear here as we explain things that Peter is not saying that baptism saves you. He is simply making an analogy between the waters of the flood that wash clean a world polluted by sin and the truth illustrated by baptism that we are cleansed from our sins through the blood, the shed blood of Jesus. That's why Peter adds that we're not saved by literal washing of dirt from our skin. That's not what saves us. But he uses a phrase, an appeal to God for a good conscience. What does that mean? An appeal to God means you recognize your need for salvation. You recognize your need for Jesus. That is what saves us. So baptism doesn't save anyone. It's a symbol. It represents that you have been saved. We mentioned that yesterday we had the wedding for Whitney and Rainer. It was a beautiful setting, and I had the privilege of leading them through the ring ceremony where they exchanged their rings to one another and their vows to one another. And a ring, I have one here for me, 42 years of marriage, that a ring, if you have a ring, you can look at it. It it symbolizes an inward commitment that you've made, okay? Okay? And that's the way baptism is. It's an outward confession, as it were, of an inward commitment 
that you've made to Jesus. So baptism in itself isn't going to save you. It simply declares, demonstrates, proclaims that you are a believer in Jesus. You have put your faith in Him. So let's be clear about that. But don't miss the flow of Peter's argument here. Where's he going with all this? He's going to tie it together, I promise you. Notice what he's talking about. In talking about what saves us, Peter mentions the third major episode in Jesus' life, and that is Christ's resurrection. Christ's resurrection from the dead. Notice at the end of verse 21, Peter says, we are saved through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is through Christ's victory on the cross, as confirmed by His resurrection, He's alive today, that we are saved, that we are cleansed from our sins. Well, now we're ready for the fourth major event in Jesus' life that Peter wants to emphasize, and that is Christ's vindication. Vindication means exaltation, His glorification. Jesus humbled Himself there on the cross, and now He's been vindicated, exalted. Verse 22 leads us back to Peter's original argument that though Jesus suffered unjustly, he was ultimately vindicated by God. Peter writes in verse 22, who, that's Jesus, is at the right hand of God having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him. He writes as if his victory is already completed. It is done. Notice where Jesus is today. He is at the right hand of God. I love the little girl who said, God in heaven cannot use his right hand. He can only use his left hand because Jesus is sitting on his right hand. Now, that may be cute, but that is inaccurate. That's not the case. Jesus, to be sitting on the right hand side of God, symbolizes Jesus' exaltation to a place of supreme honor and glory and power. To be at the right-hand side means He has been exalted, glorified, honored above all else. From this place of honor, everything in heaven and on earth is going to be submitted, subjected to Him. As the Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, Because Jesus was willing to humble Himself, remember how that passage begins in Philippians 2, how He humbled Himself by becoming one of us? What a downward step that was for God to take. And how He humbled Himself even further by becoming a servant to serve us? And how He humbled Himself even to the point of death, a criminal's death, death on the cross, the lowest kind of death you could experience? And because He was willing to humble Himself, Verse 9 in Philippians 2 says, God highly exalted him, I love that, and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee is going to bow. Those who are in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, the ultimate universal glory and honor that is going to be given to Jesus because He was willing to suffer unjustly for our sakes. Now, why does Peter bring this all out? Here's his point. Very simply, Peter is making us walk through the example of Jesus because he wants to make this point. Good things happen when we're willing to suffer unjustly for Jesus' sake. Jesus' sake. Good things happen. God will vindicate us, reward us. This is Peter's whole argument. Remember, he's talking to a first century persecuted people who've had to leave and scatter, who are dying because of their faith and doing so willingly because they will not deny their Lord. Wow. But he's letting them know that whatever you may have to suffer in this life will be more than compensated in the next. Just as Jesus was vindicated ultimately when He suffered unjustly for our sakes, so we will be vindicated ultimately by God when we suffer for Jesus' sake. And what we need to display more in our country, in our world, is the same calm courage that the first century believers faced. Let's not panic. 
We know that in the end, God's going to win, and we're on the winning side, and we're going to stay calm, and we're going to stay loving, loving. No matter how much they say we're a hate group, that's not who we are. And we're going to stay loving no matter what. Amen, folks? Amen. Amen. And what this means, and I know that this can sound trite, but when people are mean to us, we're not going to respond in kind. If they go low, we go high. If they're mean, we're kind. If they show hate, we show love. That is the Jesus way to respond to hatred. And it is the best way to change the dynamic of any relationship. Think in your life right now, someone who doesn't agree with you, doesn't vote like you, that you can't have a conversation with without it coming into an argument, how should you respond? Not always trying to achieve somehow, beat the person down and get them to view life the way you do. That probably won't happen. But to show love, kindness, thoughtfulness, courtesy, always, always. That needs to be our conviction. And the promise we need to cling to when this world turns against Christians, and make no mistake, it is, and it's going to get worse. But as it does, our conviction is in a promise. And that promise is, if we honor God, He will honor us. If we humble ourselves when going through adversity, any kind of adversity, whether it's a health crisis, an economic crisis, a relational crisis, because of persecution, whatever adversity we go through, when we humble ourselves in it, God will exalt us. He will vindicate us. If not in this life, then certainly in the next life. Notice 1 Peter 5, 6, later on in this letter, Peter's going to say, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. He's thinking of adversity in our lives. Whatever you're going through, the difficult time you're facing right now, humble yourself under God during this time, and the promise is that He may exalt you at the proper time, the time of His choosing. Our problem is we want it right now. No, God will exalt us at the proper time. So, this is what we need to do is honor Jesus, no matter what, by how we respond to hate. And this is how we advance God's cause. This is how we honor Jesus. So, what does this look like? How should we respond when others, how should you respond when others are mean to you? Think about in your life, someone who doesn't agree with you. When maybe someone yells at you, says mean things to you, maybe even curses you, how should you respond? Well, the answer is, don't act in kind, okay? Don't act like they're acting and treating you. Instead, act like Jesus and how He acted when He was treated unfairly, the just for the unjust, and yet was vindicated by God. God will vindicate you if you respond the Jesus way, not your own way. The way we defeat hate is not with more hate, but with love. We've got to be convinced of that. So before you attack that person who doesn't agree with you on an issue, or type an angry email with lots of capital letters and exclamation points trying to get your viewpoint, your anger across, think of another way you can respond. You don't have to compromise your convictions. In fact, you should not compromise your convictions, your faith-based convictions. Speak the truth, but in love, always. Choose love over hate because in the end, love wins every time. God guarantees it. In the end, we know that God is going to win, right? God is going to win. We know that in the end, love is going to win. It's going to triumph over hate good over evil. We know in the end, it doesn't seem like it's always winning today. A lot of corruption, a lot of deceit going on. But we know in the end, truth and justice is going to prevail. Why do we know that? Because in the end, Jesus is going to reign supreme. He is going to be above all and over all, and every knee is going to bow, and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. We know that's where history is going. So let's not be intimidated. Let's not be discouraged. Whatever you're going through now, remember, God wants to be involved in your life. He wants to give you strength day by day and with each passing moment to help you right where you're at. And as you hold your Christian viewpoint, assuming you do, know that others aren't going to maybe agree and maybe others will 
hate you for it. All right? You're in good company. Stand like they did in the first century. Here at North Shore, we're going to be a church that stays true and stands strong for Jesus. Amen? And I hope you at home are saying amen, amen, because that's who we are. We're a community of faith that is going to stay strong for Jesus, no matter what. Now, make sure that your conviction is to not respond in kind, to choose love over hate, kindness over meanness. Make sure that's your conviction because God's going to test you. Maybe sooner than you think, someone's going to get in your face. Someone's going to disagree with you. Someone's going to say mean things about you. How are you going to respond? Well, let's ask God for His wisdom and His strength that we can proclaim the name of Jesus even in a hostile environment. Amen? Amen. Let's do that now. Let's bow our heads, shall we? Father, we thank You that we can spend this time in Your Word. Peter's writing 2,000 years ago, and it seemed like today, as far as opposition and adversity that Christians are facing, um, that they are being viewed as a threat. And I pray that we don't add to the fuel of that by how we act, but always with kindness and love and truth. We don't compromise our convictions, but we also always act in a loving, kind way. Help us to do that. Help us to be bold in our faith, courageous in our faith, and also very loving in our faith. Help us to have that right balance. Thank you for being involved in our lives. If there's anyone who hasn't made a commitment to you, that they would do so today, that they would put their faith in Jesus Christ, who was humbled, crucified, but has been exalted and vindicated. And one day, Jesus is going to come again and reign over all. And I pray that everyone here who hears my voice will have put their faith, their trust in Jesus Christ. It's in His name that we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.